Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's video presentation, Trends to Watch in 2020. I'm Yuri Wormser, Principal Analyst at eMarketer, and your host for today's Meet the Analyst webinar. I'm joined by my colleague and fellow Principal Analyst, Jillian Ryan, who covers B2B for us. Hey, Jillian, how are hey, you? Hey, Yuri, happy to be here. Glad to have you. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. First, I'd like to thank Inmobi for making today's presentation possible. And this event, event is powered by our video uh, platform, Brand Live. Jillian has a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We'll email you a link with the slides and the full recording. If you have questions, you can send them our way using the window on the lower right hand of the screen. We'll address as many as we can during the Q&A. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jillian to get us started. Well, thanks, Yuri. As I said, I am really happy to be here. And this is uh, a really unique piece of content that we have been publishing for eight years at eMarketer, our key digital trends report published, I believe, on Monday of this week. And then we're giving a kind of condensed version of that in this webinar presentation. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the methodology process and how we curated all of these trends, because even though I, I led the report and authored it, it really, I mean, as you know, as one of the contributors, was a group effort. We started the process in October, and we brought all the analysts together, and each analyst at eMarketer covers a different beat, and we had everybody come to the table with, okay, digital's complicated, marketing's complicated, what's the most exciting thing, the most relevant thing for marketers and advertisers that's happening in your area? And over the course of about eight weeks, we met multiple times, and we poked holes in each other's arguments, and we figured out what the burning questions that our clients and that marketers would be thinking about as we embark into 2020. So just to start off our presentation, these are some of the questions that we're thinking about. Will the 2020 election affect brands? Will media consolidation continue? How are privacy laws, which we talk about all the time, changing media budgets? What are the trends in consumer behavior that I need to know as a marketer, as an advertiser? And then lastly, we'll jump into 5G, which, which you'll take the helm on as our mobile analyst, and how that will impact marketers and advertisers. So let's dive in, and we're going to start this presentation by really talking about digital media. There's a lot happening uh, in that part of the landscape with publishers and ad um, that advertisers are partnering with. Um, so 2020 is certainly going to be a year of heightened polarization in media. This was a trend that was written by our principal analyst, Nicole Perrin. Um, and while we won't be getting political in this presentation, um, it, marketers and advertisers need to be aware that 2020, an election year, is going to potentially cause some brand safety issues for them. Um, we have a stat that's up here on the slide from Civic Science that says that U.S. internet users, U.S. adult internet users, agree that Facebook should ban political ads. Um, so, you know, we know that consumers are tired of, of seeing it, and we know that different social media platforms have started blocking ads and made different regulations there. Um, even Twitter, you know, has, has banned ads, I believe TikTok as well. Um, so for an advertiser, this kind of puts them in a, in a unique position. You know, if you want to sell ads on Facebook, if you want to buy ads on Facebook, you will be appearing next to potentially not brand safe content. Um, and on this slide right here, we have some, you know, potential images that you could appear next to. And I think brands moving into 2020 need to be careful to make sure that they're not appearing next to these types of content. Um, it is interesting, though, because despite all these concerns and in years past when there were election years, we actually haven't seen spend decrease on Facebook or YouTube. Um, so marketers are, are still there. But if it isn't the, controver the potential controversy in an election year that you know, prevents a brand from spending, it, it could be increased prices that we think an election year might bring. Uh, Nicole, when she wrote this trend in the report, uh, highlighted that there's, there might be rising prices, you know, a, a lack of inventory because all the candidates are kind of scooping up all the available um, you know, pl placements on Facebook and even you know, in, in the TV world and video world. Um, so brands are going to have to compete with that and may have to even spend more money to stand out against the noise. It's it, interesting that all the money is flowing into Facebook and to Google, um, and it's just a sign of how important these platforms actually are. 
Yeah, no, and, and, and that certainly dovetails nicely with um, our second prediction that is also about digital media, and that has to do with consolidation. Um, we think that from players big and small that that will continue in 2020. And this is something that isn't new. We've been talking about consolidation in media for a number of years. Last year in our Key Trends report, it was one of our predictions. So this is really a continuation of, of that narrative and, and not going in a different direction. Um, on the, the slide right now, we have our uh, eMarketer forecast that shows uh, U.S. digital ad spending and how big of a portion the triopoly really has. And you could see from 2019 to 2020, it's just a small increase, but you know, the between Google and Facebook and Amazon, they have more, like roughly 70% of the U.S. digital advertising landscape. Uh, year over year, we've seen Google slightly decrease, but Facebook and Amazon are, are still growing strong. And one of the points that Nicole highlights um, in, in her trend is that each of these giants has their own specialty, their own domain um, that they've been able to, to really lead. So Google obviously leads search and Facebook leads display. Amazon has been able to enter into the arena with these giants because of its expertise and its, um, you know, the inventory that it has for e-commerce type um, advertisement, advertising placements. Um, and moving into 2020, we, we really think that uh, both Facebook and Amazon, the smaller players in the larger triopoly, will, will start to go beyond performance offerings. That's what they're known for right now. And really start looking into, well, what kind of brand offerings can we provide to our advertisers? And I think that's something that marketers in 2020 should be on the lookout for. And that's also the, the consolidation is, is happening not just on the big players, it's happening with the small players as well. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. So it's like you have two different sides of the market. You have the giants, the triopoly, but then you also have the long tail of, of digital advertising publishers. And uh, 2019, saw, we saw a lot of consolidation. We saw a lot of acquisitions. Vox Media purchased New York Mag. Vice purchased Refinery29, and those that's all digital publishers. And then even on the OTT side of the world, we had Roku purchase DataZoo, a DSP, in order to really bolster um, the data that they have um, you know, at their fingertips, Roku, of course. Um, and in Nicole's analysis of, of, of this, she really thinks that these sellers are looking to band together to compete with the triopoly rather than competing against each other for that small 30% of the market. If they combine forces, they'll be able to potentially have a better reach have more scale, have better targeting capabilities, and, and of course, measurement. So uh, on both sides of the spectrum, um, it's certainly happening. And while, you know, in the meantime, this means that marketers and advertisers are going to have fewer publishers that they can buy for, you know, as, as these smaller publishers, you know, innovate their offering in order to compete with the wall, with the wall gardens, with the triopoly, we think that that'll mean exciting things um, for advertisers as these new and innovative formats come to life. It's interesting because I think they're justifying it publicly as a way to protect consumers and to offer a better experience and protect uh, consumer data. Yeah. But actually, it's, they're really being forced into it. Yeah, no, they're, they're, it's, it's, their hands is forced, and, and a big reason for that actually dovetails nicely with the third trend that we'll cover today, which is about privacy. I mean, we know that privacy laws are here. They're either, you know, the GDPR has been here for a while. CCPA is literally around the corner, a couple of weeks away, and this will impact media budgets in 2020. Um, last year, you know, we took we took stock of this. This was one of our predictions last year as well that the privacy laws would have implications on how marketers are doing their media planning, and we knew that that it would poke holes in in marketers' attempts to do holistic targeting, to do holistic attribution, and this isn't just because of the the legislation, but also browser crackdowns with their limiting third party tracking. Um, that's been a big force in 2019, will continue to be a big force in 2020. And even Google got on the bandwagon, which uh, Lauren Fisher, who's the analyst who really spearheaded this trend, uh, was surprised to see. And what, so what does this mean for marketers? How is this changing budgets? And in the immediate moment, we think that it's going to help the walled gardens, the triopoly, and the other social networks 
get even stronger. Um, we think that marketers will shift their dollars even more into the arms of the walled gardens. Um, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, so when we think about what this means for marketers, um, as this regulation comes to fruition, as these crackdowns on the browsers become more and more prominent, marketers are going to want to advertise with sellers, ad sellers, that are capable of managing privacy compliant regulations that have the scale and the reach and the targeting and the measurement already in place because they're within this closed ecosystem. Um, and Lauren also highlights that something that we're gonna continue to watch into 2020 is the open web, are those long tail publishers, and how are they consolidating or innovating um, to really make a privacy compliant ecosystem and a safe ecosystem for marketers and advertisers. Um, we think that that's happening in a few ways. Um, ID consortia is certainly um, a bubbling up topic. And then we've also seen contextual ad buys start to, to breathe new life. We've seen that in 2019, and we think that we'll witness that in 2020 as well. And, and that means taking on a new definition of what contextual means and, and how publishers can use the first party data that they have that maybe doesn't identify specifically who the marketer or the advertiser is targeting, but what they're doing and adding context to the experience. Is that something that you've seen it in mobile at all? Definitely seeing it. I mean, we've seen it for a while in gaming um, where uh, behavior within the game is a pretty good indication of what the person who's playing the game would be interested in. And obviously the game itself is a good indicator. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing it in the broader mobile sphere as well, um, these, these bigger types of contextual advertising. Yeah, it's great. Um, so. From what you said, it sounds like things are pretty rosy for the wild gardens, but that's not necessarily the case. I think for the time being, we think that the triopoly is going to continue to entrench itself, you know, but there are some things on the horizon that might change that. I mean, some of that is potential antitrust legislation that could be coming down, TBD, we'll see what happens. But I also think that there's some trends in consumer time that we called out in the report that are, are worth exploring, and we'll, we'll spend some time doing that today. Um, the first is about Facebook, which is the second biggest piece of the triopoly pie. Uh, in 2020, it'll have 24% of US digital ad dollars. So that's nothing to snuff out. It's about a quarter of the entire market. But that continues to happen as Facebook tries to chase engagement. And this was one of the trends that our principal analyst, uh, Debbie Williamson, who covers social media, uh, was, was really adamant about sharing because even though the dollars are flowing to Facebook, users aren't necessarily staying with Facebook. Uh, on the screen right now, you'll see a November, our November 2019 forecast about time spent with media. And this forecast was actually published just a few weeks ago. We were barely even able to squeeze it into the report. That's how timely this data is. Um, but if you look at, at from 2019 to 2020, you'll see 34 minutes. That's how much um, US adults are spending per day with Facebook, but that decreases to 33 minutes. And then of course it's like, well, it's just a minute, but it isn't just a minute. When you look at the beginning of the forecasting period, you could see that in, 20, in 2016, it was 40 minutes. So it's been a downward trend for years at this point um, and will continue to decline. But what's also interesting is if you look at the chart, there's a black and a gray line. So Snapchat and Instagram, and that's on the up. And a big reason for um, a decline in engagement on Facebook is because the 18 to 24 year old cohort is spending less time there as they engage with these newer, funner perhaps apps um, and they're spending more time there. So what does this mean for marketers? I mean, if you're a marketer and you're spending a lot on Facebook and users are perhaps spending less time there, it means really looking at your your analytics, really diving into your metrics and making sure that you're targeting and that you're reaching active and engaged users. Um, so that's something that we think in 2020 um, should be uh, an important concern for marketers. If Facebook has really tried different tactics to try to reverse that. I mean, they've some of them have worked to an extent like uh, the, the stories on top of Facebook. Yeah. But in, that, in fact, even though it's, you know, people are using them to an extent, they're not using them as much as they are on Instagram. And even those who are, uh, it's much harder to monetize that than the, the feed and people are spending less time on it. 
And they've also tried streaming, mobile streaming, uh, video yeah. streaming with IGTV mm -hmm. and Facebook Watch. And that really, has, they've had a hard time launching that. And I think you're going to talk about that a little bit next, like wider, wider yeah. such competition. Yeah, so that, that bleeds in very nicely to our next trend. And you're, you're really right. Facebook Watch, I think, could, sounds like a good idea in, in theory, but not when you're up against, if on the slide right now, you'll see all of the entrants that we've had um, that have already been in the landscape and that have continued to join the the streaming video landscape. I mean, just in the last couple of months, Disney Plus, Apple TV. So there's really an influx of streaming services. And this impacts marketers and advertisers that have traditionally relied on on cable television, on TV, to reach a broad audience at, at once. Um, and with all of these new apps, consumer time and attention is certainly more fragmented. And then you also have the challenge ahead that, well, if consumers are spending more time with Netflix, that means they're in a non-ad supported environment. So they're watching content that they've paid for and they're not potentially, they're not seeing ads, not even potentially, it's, it's, it's a certainty that it isn't happening. Of course, on platforms like Hulu, there's an ad-free version and an ad-supported version. But even within all of these platforms, for an advertiser to buy media on them, it, it's not like a one a one stop shop. Um, it's a fragmented buying experience because the consumer experience is so fragmented, and those those you know replicating that reach essentially is going to be incredibly challenging for marketers in 2020. And we think that this is one of the areas of consumer time that marketers might have the hardest uh, time cracking. However, um, our video analyst, Ross Bennis, um, just is releasing a video um, trends report in a few weeks, and he has a lot of best practices that marketers should be thinking about as they um, continue to try to solve this problem in 2020. Yeah, and, and as you see more traditional TV shift to CTV and OTT, you're going to, the, the brand buyers are going to have to you know, become fully digital. Right now, you still have the people who are used to buying on TV, buying up fronts and places mm -hmm. like Hulu and so forth. I think it's at some point, you're going to have to see that come together and become much more programmatic throughout the whole system. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, something we're seeing. But we're, we're not just seeing it with video, right? We're seeing it with other types of streaming video, uh, yeah. media as well. No, I mean, it, that, it's a great point. And another of the trends that we saw about consumer time is really the continued rise and prominence of audio. Um, and Lauren Fisher, who, who um, spearheaded this trend, says that she thinks that audio advertising in 2020 will start to look a lot more like the rest of digital. Um, this is something we talked about in our report from last year, that audio would have a marquee year in 2019. It did. Uh, podcasts are a really big reason for that. Um, and we think in 2020 that this will be, that audio will become an even bigger part of a marketer and advertiser's media mix and figuring out how audio fits into you know the work that you're doing with digital publishers into video and into your entire um, cross-platform strategy will be something that marketers are going to start tackling in 2020 um, and there's a big reason for that um, we have a, a chart here that in 2020 according to our forecast this will be the first year that um, U.S. adults will spend more time with digital audio than they have with radio for the first time ever. I mean, and if you look at the beginning of the forecasting period, which is 2016, there was still a sizable gap between digital audio and radio. Radio was in the lead. So with each year, it's, it's whittled and whittled away, and digital audio is the new kind of listening mode for consumers. And you mentioned it, uh, you mentioned radio, and that was the original live mass media, but you're seeing that, well, I, I think you, uh, you have some more on, on audio advertising, but yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly true. Audio has really, I mean, it doesn't mean radio isn't going away and that isn't a way to reach um, your audience, but um, digital audio is really the way forward. Um, and Lauren calls out a couple of, um, of points, you know, there's greater scale, and that's a pretty obvious leap. You know, if there's more audience, there's more opportunity to reach that audience, which potentially means more inventory. There's also a greater use of automation. We've seen the platforms that are, are leading the pack here, Spotify, Pandora, have started building programmatic pipes um, in order to really automate the buying and the selling of their inventory on their platform. 
um, which also provides um, the opportunity for richer audience targeting. And these platforms and these publishers have what marketers are looking for, first party data. You know, we talked at the beginning about uh, privacy, you know, a privacy compliant and a safe place to advertising to advertise and audio can really provide that as well. And, and all of those factors really lead to a greater migration of brand dollars to audio. But of course, I mean, there's a lot of fun and exciting things that we're talking about, cross screen, automation, targeting. But you know, as audio becomes more mature and starts looking like the rest of di digital, I think there'll start to be a couple of the, the not so fun things that marketers will experience, ad blocking being one of them. Um, and also, you know, fraud is, is another potential um, factor that might come to be in audio in 2020. Yeah, I, I could definitely, wherever money is flowing, you're going to see the fraudsters find a way to benefit from it. And undoubtedly, you'll see more of that in audio as well. Yeah, yeah. So good, but also something to look out for, too, on the audio front. Um, and for our last trend, uh, the fourth one about consumer behaviors, we wanted to call it live streaming. Um, and of course, we're currently live streaming on LinkedIn, so we're right on with this trend. Um, and Jasmine Enberg, who's our senior analyst who covers global trends and social media, um, really called out that live streaming, which was once perhaps niche in that it was just for gamers or esports. Um, viewers, um, it's really coming into the limelight. And a reason for that is because just like on LinkedIn and, and just like on these other major platforms, a live streaming option is now embedded into the native experience. So that's on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch even. And in terms of uh, an e-marketer number to kind of back up, well, just how big is this audience? According to our latest forecast in 2020, there'll be 115 million live video viewers in the US. And that's just less than half of all digital video viewers are watching live stream. So when we define live stream, just to give a little bit of context, because it can mean a lot of things, you could see the definition actually on the chart. We're talking about video content from any device um, that's live events, news, linear OTV, social media, of course, sports and video gaming. Now, we think live streaming can really offer a lot of things to marketers. Um, and similar to what we just talked about with podcasts, um, we think that live streaming can do for video what podcasts have done for, for audio. Um, Jasmine actually says that it, it's a way to breathe new life into, into the video medium. And it also has the ability to, to help marketers reach harder, harder to reach audiences. And you know, it's, it's also a, a form of organic content too. I know most of the trends that we've been talking about today are about advertising, but we can't, we can't you know, ignore just how valuable organic content is. And if brands wanna start live streaming on their own platforms and creating content to engage with existing customers, to do tutorials, to do product reviews, and even to engage with influencers as well, um, so we really think that the resurgence of live streaming is going to have that impact for marketers um, in 2020. Um, so I've pushed this presentation as, as far as I can with authority, but Yuri, you are our mobile expert. So as we dive into 5G, I will literally pass the baton over to you. This was the trend that you wrote in our report this year. So why don't you uh, give us a little bit of uh, an overview about why 5G will be so important in 2020? Yeah, sure. So. 2019 was a was a really big year for 5G. Um, it was the year that all of the major networks in the U.S. launched mm -hmm. uh, their 5G services. You saw major networks launch in China, in Korea, in parts of Europe. Um, so 5G went from a concept to a reality in, five, in 2019. But when you look at the actual numbers of people connecting to 5G networks, it's minuscule at this point. Yeah. Um, this is some data from IHS Market, um, and it showed that it shows that only 9.5 million handsets um, have sold globally. 5G handsets have sold globally in 2019. So, a tiny fraction. Yeah, it's of, a really uh, small number. It's surprising. A really, when you're talking about global numbers, it's tiny. Yeah. Um, in 2020, that's going to change a bit. You're going to we're going to see. 73.7 um, million estimated um, handsets sold, 5G handsets that's sold. A substantial jump. I mean, that's what's like almost seven times, more than seven times. Yeah, it's it's more than seven times. And the, and the 
thing is, it's not just you know that you have all these handsets coming out. You're, you're going to see a huge um, renewal cycle towards the end of the year with the second generation 5G handsets mm -hmm. coming out on Android. But even more importantly, you're going to see Apple uh, likely release the 5G handset in September or October next year. And what's that? That's going to lead us to a huge uh, cycle of, of um, mobile phone sales. Mm -hmm. And with all of these pe people buying 5G devices, you're actually going to have a, a legitimate pool of people to, for yeah. 5G services. Is this happening in the US, China? Where do you think these sales will be most prominent? So in fact, of, that, of those 75 million or 73 million plus, um, more than half are probably going to be in China. Oh, um, so wow. China is leaping uh, all in into 5G. Le leading the way. Definitely leading the way with the, both the network expansion and also uh, the number of people buying the handsets. Great. Um, by 2023, nearly half a billion uh, handsets will be sold at a 5G per year, mm -hmm. um, and that's on top of you know the handsets that sold in 2022, 2021. You're going to have um, a huge amount of consumers having 5G handsets at that point, and you're going to have networks that are really legitimately 5G throughout. Yeah. Um, so by then, 5G is really going to hit its full potential. Yeah. It looks like this will be something that'll be in our trends report for the, at least the next couple of years. Probably the next decade. <laughs> So, so why is 5G a big deal? Um, there are really four main reasons. One is faster throughput speeds, um, and it's, that's just downloads and uploads. It's what we think of when we think of an upgrade in a network. Mm -hmm. You know that you know movies will be fully downloaded in a second or two um, under 5G. Uh, but in some ways, some of the other impacts are going to be a lot bigger. They're a little harder to grasp um, now. But something like lower latency, which means near immediate responsiveness to commands. Um, and what that means is, let's say you're playing a game remotely mm -hmm. with another player a thousand uh, miles away. If you touch your phone to, as, uh, on a command for the, for the game, mm -hmm. that person a thousand miles away will see it nearly instantly, maybe one or two milliseconds later. Wow. Um, that's just one tiny little you know, possibility. Another possibility would be medicine. Um, people operating, uh, doing remote surgery. Mm -hmm. You can't have any meaningful lag when you're doing remote surgery. You know, someone looking at a monitor, uh, uh, guiding a machine, a, a robotic machine a thousand miles away or 500 miles away will need near instant reactions from that machine. Yeah. That's what we mean by low latency. So it has huge industrial potential and, and, a, and a huge potential in things like augmented reality, gaming, interactive media. Um, so that's, that's huge. Um, there's massive connectivity, which is much denser network of devices. It means that instead of having, you know, uh, uh, let's say 10 devices within a, within a 10 or 20 square meters, you'll mm -hmm. be able to have, you know, several thousand. Wow. Just, uh, and that means all types of IoT devices can be installed. You can have, uh, you know, many more phones off of one cell and, and, and stuff like that. And lastly, it's just um, there's so many redundancies in the signal on how to bounce uh, uh, to reach the device. It's just much more reliable. You're not going to have uh, drop calls. You're not going to have slow speeds. It's just you're going to have um, much better service. And all of those things, and it's, the reliability is you know, another thing when you're talking about things like industrial per, uh, uses, those mm -hmm. things are super important as well. Yeah. Um, so what does it mean for marketers? Well, there are a few things. One is. Um, with this huge influx of phones coming in 2020, um, I, you know, the consumers are going to set, uh, spend a lot of money on those phones. Yeah. Let's say a thousand dollars, maybe more, fourteen hundred for some of these, fifteen hundred. They're going to expect 5G experiences, and the the fact is that the networks themselves are incrementally getting better. Yeah. So that the marketers um, and and the people thinking about media experiences will really need to start having experiences that start taking advantage of the early abilities of 5G. Mm -hmm. You know, more interactivity. Um, Even like AR VR, I would assume, I, right? I think mobile augmented reality in particular yeah. um, is really going to take off, and there are going to be a lot of ways you can use apps. Um, for augmented reality because you can send stuff to the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're going to start seeing that more of that towards the end of 2020. Um, and the second thing the marketers really need to think about is that they need to get their infrastructure ready. So the networks are only as good as you know, the apps that are running on it and the servers that are feeding it. Mm -hmm. And if the marketers you know, don't work with their IT staff to get fast servers and um, really make a seamless experience in their, in their apps, 
they're not going to have a 5G experience even if the networks can provide it. Yeah. So, um, that's that's something else that people really need to start thinking about now so that when 5G is really taking off, it's ready. Yeah, get, getting yourself situated for when those phones start coming in at the end of the year. Exactly. Well, great. Uh, I want to take a few minutes. Thank you, Yuri, for covering 5G. You did a much <laughs> better job than I would have done on that topic. Uh, there are some key takeaways. We talked about a lot of trends. I believe eight we actually covered, which I'm very impressed that we did that in such a quick time. Uh, but for the audience, I think it's important that we just recap what each one of those were. Um, first, we talked about media. 2020 will be a very polarizing year in digital media. Um, and that'll also happen as media consolidation continues from both the triopoly and the smaller players on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we think privacy laws will push more dollars into the walled gardens, at least for now. We'll see how that shakes out. Uh, Facebook user engagement is on the decline. That's something that marketers need to be paying attention to. Video viewers will become even harder to reach as they become more splintered in how they're watching on all these different apps and cable and live streaming. Um, audio advertising is going to have another big year as audio has another big year. Uh, as I mentioned, live streaming, which kind of connects with our video trend, uh, will get a second life for sure and um, open the doors for marketers to have a more authentic connection with organic content uh, in their audiences. And then lastly, as, as you uh, highlighted, 5G will become more than just hype uh, in 2020. So thanks. Thanks, Jillian. That was really, really interesting and really great. Um, so in just a bit, we'll be joined by Ann Frisbee, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Inmobi, North America, and then we'll answer your questions live. But first, let's watch uh, this quick clip. Technology has always shaped how we communicate with one another. The wheel, the printing press, the Pony Express, the telegraph, the telephone, the computer, and mobile devices. Technology changes, yet one truth remains. We want our communications and interactions to be meaningful and have relevance. Today, however, driving real connections are easier said than done. But we help brands do that, to drive real connections. With our platform technology and exclusive mobile data, Inmobi helps you understand, identify, engage, and acquire your customers. Inmobi, driving real connections. Welcome back. We're joined by Ann Frisbee from Inmobi. Hi, Ann. Hi. Nice I, to see you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. So you heard our presentation. Um, yes. I spoke a little bit about, about 5G, and I know you have a lot of thoughts about that. So how is 5G going to affect mobile marketing? Yeah, I mean, obviously you went through a ton of changes, and it's pretty fundamental probably to changing our lives, right? From driverless cars to, I mean, so many things we can't even envision. Um, one thing that I am focused on is just the improvement that 5G is going to deliver in terms of location data signals from the carriers. Um, so to understand this, you kind of have to understand a little bit of how carriers have location data signals today. Um, so right now, in, a carrier has to have location signals from its consumers because they need to provide phone service. It's an essential asset for the carriers because if you want to make a phone call, they need to know where you are in order to provide that service. Um, now, right now, if they want to triangulate where a consumer is, they're looking at where that mobile device is in comparison to the two nearest cell towers. Cell towers today, we often see them in the cities like up on the hills. They're very big. They cover a relatively large area. And you're kind of triangulating a, a consumer's location uh, down to probably 300 to 400 meters. Now, when 5G rolls out, it's a completely different infrastructure, and it's really these small cell sites, right, that are getting set up on, you know, light posts on the out-of-home billboards. And there are many more of them. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. They're much closer together. They're not covering as large of an area. That gives you a more dense network you talked about, your better cell phone coverage, and a lot of these benefits that 5G gives, right? But the other thing it does is now, when I'm trying to figure out where a user is to give them better cell phone coverage, I'm triangulating between two towers that are very close together. And as a result now, the carrier location signals will actually be to the level of accuracy as the GPS lat long signals that you know your weather apps and a lot of the other apps out in the marketplace provide. And so that'll give now 
a lot of location signals about consumers because you're constantly needing to know where they are to provide them cell phone service. You might have 600 location signals a day from users, but you also now will have it within a 20 to 25 meters instead of 350 meters of location. So I think that's going to have fundamental changes in improving consumer experiences. You think about mapping or fitness apps or my, you know, wearables, you know, I use Strava for hiking, you know, all these different things. But it also has potential to really improve uh, advertising, assuming that consumers will opt into those services and enable the data to be used there. So um, I think that's another thing that I see as a big potential improvement uh, as 5G rolls out. So, I mean, location data also can obviously help retailers identify customers near them or, you know, yeah. various ways. How, how do you see mobile changing the link between online and offline? Yeah, gosh, I'm so happy to talk about this. I, I'm very excited. Um, well, first off, I've been in digital media since 1996, since the start. And the first kind of 20 years have really been about digital outputs. Okay, do I have my website? Okay, now do I have a mobile optimized website? Do I have an app? Um, okay, I want to drive qualified traffic to my website. I want to drive web sales. Um, and in fact, my web store may even compete with my offline stores. Mm. But what I've really seen in 2019 is a fundamental shift where obviously digital marketing, I mean, everything is becoming digital and there's more and more devices and there's fragmentation of devices and mobile really is at the center of that. And there's such a link in your life between mobile and your offline experiences, right? Because your phone is with you. And I think marketers are starting to really connect the dots between offline and online, between offline and digital. So a couple things I'm seeing as examples of this clearly, um, like the CPG clients have led the way because they don't own the retail locations and they've had to measure campaigns, looking at offline purchase lift, trying to measure through Nielsen and IRI multi-touch attribution. So they're clearly starting to do that with their campaign out of really being forced to, right? Because they don't have the channels. But now you're starting to see agencies and DSPs and marketers talk about the potential of coordinating their out-of-home billboard purchases and their mobile campaigns. There was this uh, study done, like a neuroscience study out of the UK where the brain like lit up in similar ways between mobile and billboards. Huh. And someone said, oh, that probably means that those two channels might really have synergies to like work together. And, and it's very different how your brain lights up to TV. That was like in this report. And I'm like, okay, so now you're starting to see clients saying, okay, how do I coordinate these? And maybe I need to retarget consumers who've gone through, a, you know, been exposed to that billboard, right? Gone through the view shed of that billboard and maybe re-hit them with mobile marketing. And will that really provide kind of more than one plus one in terms of the impact of that advertising? Mm. Um, and then the other thing I'm seeing now is instead of just always driving website visits, marketers are realizing, hey, I have a valuable brick and mortar storefront, like footprint. And in fact, maybe that's a big differentiator for me increasingly with Amazon. And, in, you know, if I drive someone to the website, let's say 5% of the people buy, if we make up numbers, right? If I can get people into my store, almost all of them end up purchasing something, right? Maybe that's 85% of them walk away buying something once they're in the store. So I'm starting to see people begin to test really measuring digital campaigns and mobile campaigns to drive to in-store purchases and really looking at kind of footfall attribution. And that ties a little bit back to the improved location signals, right? As that improves, more and more I can really connect better my consumers offline and my digital marketing experiences and maybe drive business results that don't just tie to digital outputs, right? So I think that's pretty exciting and uh, opens up a lot of opportunities for mobile. Yeah, for sure. And I'm curious to see you know, how uh, 5G with mobile augmented reality will go into that as well. Um, Jill, uh, Jillian mentioned um, the brand flight to, the set flight to safety for brands and the, the fragmentation uh, of media. How, how is that? How are brands responding in mobile marketing to that? Yeah. Okay. So this has probably been the biggest um, beneficial impact for InMobi's business, honestly. Um, so when we launched InMobi Exchange four or five years ago. 
almost all brand marketers actually blocked running on gaming content. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm not really sure why this was the case. We had put together all these one sheeters and educational instructions to really try to convince brands that mobile gaming and casual gaming was actually a really great place to market. So now flash forward to 2020, 2019, we don't even educate marketers anymore about this because almost every brand that we work with runs on casual gaming. It has been a very uh, brand safe area, right? This is an entertaining, non-controversial, professionally programmed, um, and it's part of that fragmentation, yeah. right? Instead of TV, like I may be spending a lot of time on these games yeah. to enjoy myself. Or doing it both at the same time. You have like, you know, when you're using your, your phone to play a game exactly. and watching something. And it's not at the political, right? Like it's not, it's you fun. know, about Trump. <laughs> it's just that you're having a good time. You're trying to find the words quickly in the box, you know? <laughs> so, um, so mar most of the marketers now, there's very few block gaming content. And the gaming app developers run really high impact video placements. So they're full screen video placements that have very high viewability, 90% viewability, 75% video completion rates. They act almost like TV commercials where they play in between game levels and it's like an expected experience for consumers now. And I think that flight to safety and tackling consumer uh, media fragmentation, like one of the benefits for us has been in-app mobile video and just how well that's done for marketers and how much more they're willing to run there. And you know, conversely, I will say four years ago, very few marketers didn't run in news content. Um, so now everyone's running in gaming, but I would say news is often a block category now. So it's, it's really like the reverse has kind of happened in terms of people being worried about the controversy. Yeah. Right? I mean, and that totally dovetails with the with the first trend that we were talking about. Exactly. I'm, I wonder. I was how laughing <laughs> reading your report. I'm like, that's my life for the last five years. Yeah. I do wonder how that'll shift in 2021 if it's like if it's a, an election year thing or if it's just the way it is now. We'll have to see. Track yeah. <laughs> well, who's going to get elected and like how much controversy will it be? So we'll see, right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks, Anne. Thanks right. so much for having me. Absolutely. As always, I learned something just listening to you. Um, so it's time for our Q and A. Um, the first question that we get, we have from our audience. This is from James from Ohio. Uh, is it was briefly mentioned that user engagement is going down on Facebook because eighteen to twenty-four year olds are leaving? Are there any other factors that advertisers should be aware of? There's there's plenty. <laughs> um, I mean, kind of jumping off what what you know Ann just said about media. I think Facebook has a lot of controversial content, and it just isn't as fun as it used to be. Um, so, so that's a reason, you know, we mentioned Instagram and Snapchat kind of luring away the, the younger cohort. They're doing that with older cohorts too. Uh, I also think Facebook has made some, some bets. You, you made, mentioned a few of them, Yuri, like Facebook Watch and Stories. Those haven't been super successful. They also launched a dating app uh, in 2019 wasn't that successful. They now have a cryptocurrency, Libra. And I think all of these endeavors and efforts from Facebook were trying to make the platform as sticky as it used to be. And, and they just haven't gotten the traction that they thought as that time spent kind of line continues uh, to go down. Well, in our data, we really see huge growth too in TikTok. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you just have a lot of competition, right, for attention and fun things to do. And that will continue. I'm sure they'll be the next big thing, you know, but yeah, for sure they've gained a lot of users this year. Yeah. And as a company, I mean, they have Instagram, so they're not completely losing those 18 is That is really true it's and good. something it's that true. as I was working with Debbie, who wrote that section of the report, we kind of went back and forth and was like, well, are we talking about Facebook the company or Facebook the social network? And I, I should have been clear. We're talking about Facebook the social network. Yeah. As a company, it's acquisition of WhatsApp, it's acquisition of Instagram, and bringing those very successful apps into their fold has, has bolstered the overall time spent with the entire um, portfolio. But the blue app itself is what's losing users. For sure. So Jillian, this is another question for you. Okay. Um, you cover, uh, since Jillian covers B2B, are there any specific trends that B2B marketers should pay mind to in 2020? Yeah, always happy to talk about B2B. Um, I would first of all say that just because we didn't formally mention B2B in this presentation, these trends that we're talking about, all the stuff Anne's talking about is applicable to any 
and all marketers, B2B, B2C, D2C, any acronym that you that comes into the woodwork next year. Um, but in terms of B2B marketing, I mean, I, there's there's three things that I, I've, I've seen percolating for a while and, and that I think will continue to gain traction in 2020. The first is really, you know, B2B marketing, I think traditionally has focused on lead gen and bringing in new customers. And, and there's been a shift where B2B uh, marketers are now trying to uh, focus on customer growth and retention and really thinking about the, the users and the clients that they already have and how to continue to market to them and continue to engage with them. Um, and that actually hits into you know marketing and sales alignment and figuring out how marketers and sales teams can work together in order to do good marketing, reach their audiences. And, and then the last trend, which is something that um, you know we were all like, is this hype a couple of years ago is certainly account-based marketing, ABM. Um, it came up maybe like three or four years ago and a lot of people dismissed it as just like the next big trend, but it's, it's really staying around and we see B2B marketers getting even more sophisticated um, in their account-based approaches. And that's actually going to be one of my uh, first reports in 2020 is going back in. It's been a, a few years since I've done a deep dive into ABM and really going back in and seeing how it's changed, what's new, and how B2Bs are, are incorporating those strategies into their larger uh, marketing plans. Great. Um, so this is from Timothy from New York City. How can live streaming help brands uh, work with influencers? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take it unless you want it. Um, so I, I did briefly briefly mention influencers. Um, influencer marketing is certainly a more authentic and organic way that brands can reach their audiences. Um, and influencers themselves, uh, that's one of their the ways that they share content, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on Instagram, you know, they, they have posts, but they're also live streaming and, and giving their audience a view into whether it's a product review or a testimonial or a trip that they've taken. That's one of the avenues that they're using to share content. And if brands are looking to partner with influencers going on their live stream, if the metrics are right, if the audience, you know, is the right audience can be. Um, an exciting and engaging channel because you also have the ability for the influencer to be live streaming and then you can comment on it. The consumers are, are adding their input there too so it could become more interactive. I mean, celebrities now are making a fortune from their products, right? Like the, you know, you're not making your money from your music or your TV shows, right? You're making money from essentially your own direct to consumer brands. Yeah. And I do think that this, the live streaming piece, like I think the direct to consumer brands have been testing that and getting that more right just yeah. because i think that they've been trained around authenticity quite well right it's easier to a long time they were just kind of marketing on instagram right or very few platforms so they had one way to kind of create the message to the consumers as they branch out they're gonna have to figure out their own way to authentically communicate but i think that that's something that the more traditional brands can really look to which is how did these direct-to-consumer brands maybe test live streaming and what yeah. seemed to have worked, right? Yeah, and I think like the the voice that um, a brand can bring to live streaming yeah. is just it's less formal and stuffy than you get in other forms. But yet, of content. I feel like you really have to get it right. Yes, like I'm, if you come I'm off the bar. Yeah, like the bar might be even higher, which <laughs> can be tough. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely a, a tricky platform, but one with a lot of opportunity. I would definitely recommend uh, doing your research and seeing what works with your target audience before just going up there and starting a live stream. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And I, yeah, I covered some gaming for a while and um, just the amount of money that goes into the gamers and some of the esports. You know, oh, just a sponsor. Twitch has done an amazing job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so sure. it's, it's amazing. Um, so this question is from Peter from Boston. Uh, we didn't mention voice at all. Is mm. that important in 2020? Well, yeah, I mean, so uh, first of all, just because we didn't mention a trend doesn't mean that it, it isn't important. The digital landscape, marketing landscape, mobile is super complex. We only have 45 minutes. Um, but yeah, voice is very important. It came up a lot um, in, in our brainstorming session that we had amongst all the analysts. And it's really a driver of a lot of the other trends. So we're thinking about you know audio. Voice is a is a big reason that audio has had a resurgence. Um, so I would I would definitely not count voice out. Even voice search, um, you know, will continue to grow year over year. Um, so yeah, it's certainly um, 
uh, uh, important. Yeah, I just want to, for mobile search, voice is going to be huge, but there's not really advertising associated with that yet, specifically for voice. Yeah, though uh, it's interesting, right? Because if you look at the younger kids, you know, they'll be like, I'm typing, and you're like, you're talking into your phone. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they don't even seem to quite understand that, like, that isn't typing. Um, so I do think you've got this fundamental generational shift happening, which means I mean, you're gonna have to have more changes, right? Like you're gonna have to have your websites voice enabled because that's gonna become an expectation, which should work better too as you have better network speeds, right? So um, anyway, it'll keep evolving for sure. Yeah, I think it's something that marketers should be paying attention to, even if we didn't specifically mention it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is uh, probably the last question, question we have time for. It's uh, from Bruce from New York. Uh, from New York metro area. What is uh, the market's view on, audi on audience data? Are marketers learning which types of data perform best? That is, is first party data or third party data, data probabilistic or deterministic, cookie or people based, et cetera? That's, oh, I have a lot to say. I was on about this, to say this way. is right. Go for it. Yeah, so uh -huh. I mean, so in, you know, Mobi only focuses on mobile in app inventory. Right, so all of our inventory, the identifier is the device ID. And the device ID is extremely stable in comparison to cookies. Cookies continue to be massively unstable and increasingly so. And, um, you know, the open web, I think that the mobile space really is a very powerful area for people outside of the walled gardens to participate and, um, and really offer very strong solutions to buyers. And right now, I mean, when we look at a Mobi Exchange, 90% of buyers basically end up using a Mobi audiences as a part of their buys. Almost everyone is looking at targeting options and really trying to figure out how to effectively use targeting. And at least in the in-app space, I think the device IDs are really becoming more of a center point. So when you talk mm. to like a live ramp or you talk to Cubic who does footfall attribution or you talk all of these services, before it was more cookie oriented, right? Now they're really hoping marketers understand that probably device IDs are more the center and then trying to link that to your offline identifiers, your email address, your PII data versus before it was cookies and then matching cookies, right? So I really think there's been a pretty big shift where mobile is really paying a forefront, I think, in having very strong deterministic data. Now, that's not the case in the OTT space, right? Where you really have enclosed walled gardens that aren't part of the triopoly yet, that maybe will be future walled gardens. Mm -hmm. And those IDs are unique on each platform and they're not connected, right? So there are obviously consortium and ID things going forward, but I think targeting is continues to be very important. Um, unlike Europe, like there is a lot of targeting being used in the US market. I think that will continue. And I think there's just gonna be a shift in the way we get that high quality data and who's considered a high quality partner and how much of that ends up being able to be deterministic and it'll vary by channel, right? So, um, but a lot going on in that space for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I wish we had time for more questions, but that's all the time we had. Um, so thanks again to Jillian for the great presentation and a special thank you to Anne and to Emily. I loved being here guys, it was terrific. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I also want to thank our eMarketer crew and studio and behind the scenes for making this webinar possible. And finally, thanks to all of you for watching. As promised, we'll be emailing you soon with a link to the slides and full recording. Want more webinars like this? Visit, visit eMarketer.com forward slash webinars to check out what's coming up. And don't forget to check out our daily podcast, Behind the Numbers. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your workday.